be back in Marshfield. This last week I got to spend four or five days with my pastor down in Cleveland, Tennessee, and got some things set up, and, uh, and just to be with them and to uh, uh, just enjoy their graciousness. And uh, for those of you, this, this shirt is known as the Looper Effect. He went and jazzed me up a little bit at J.C. Penny while I was down there. And uh, just really enjoyed myself, and, and God's getting ready to do some things, not only here, but we're, necked in, we're networked in with a group of people that just simply love God, like uh, very few people that I have ever seen. I'm excited about that. This morning we're on lesson number 16, and we're going to finish out uh, Paths to Walk In Series 1, because it's going to, to just deal with the armor of God People don't know that you just can't sit there and say, well, I put on the helmet of salvation, I put on the breastplate of righteousness. Each one is a reality that you must walk in to have. And so we're going to do that in series two. So I want to finish up uh, Paths to Walk In series one or part or series one with just looking, we're going to we're kind of come full circle a little bit, that in an age of hyper grace, guys, Personal responsibility to walk properly in the kingdom of God is seldom spoken of. But yet it's everything. It is everything. And I believe that one of the reasons why more people don't experience victory in their lives, you can't have what you don't walk in. And there's a foundation of learning to walk in it. God just simply had me go this, uh, this last week, and he said, uh, just do a search on, on walk worthy. And it's mentioned four times in the New Testament. Three of them are mentioned by the Apostle Paul for those who like grace. Three times he told the church, you better walk worthy in what you got. And then the fourth one was in the book of Revelation chapter 3. And so I want to start this today by looking at these four occurrences where we are commanded in Scripture to walk worthy of our salvation, to walk worthy of who we are in Christ. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Guys, this, I mean, this is something that, now let me know there, there are a few within the Hebraic Roots movement that take this seriously. There are a few within the Baptist movement that take this seriously. There are a few within the Charismatic movement that take this seriously. But a majority of all those movements do not take their walk seriously. We have replaced walk with culture. And how many know that you can replace walk even with Judaica? I mean, you can have the best zitzi, you can have the best kippah, you can do all these things, but if you're not walking with God worthy of that salvation, all those things don't mean a thing. And it's the same thing within the charismatic movement. You know that you can speak in tongues all day long and it do you no good? Or to the Baptist, you can, sp you can pray in English all day long and it just be a religious front. It's down to the personal walk, the nitty and the gritty every day. Those are the things that either set stumbling blocks before us or cause what the devil puts in front of us to become stepping stones. It's our walk and understanding our responsibility to walk properly with God. Let's look at this in verse 1. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you. What does beseech mean? Beg. It's like he's getting down on one knee and says, listen, guys, I'm begging you to do this. It's this important. It's like Romans chapter 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourselves a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord. If they don't, he said, listen, if you don't, if you don't go here, you don't go there. We like to quote in, in, in Romans chapter 12 that all things work together for those, for good for those who called him. Not if you don't submit yourself as a living sacrifice, he can't do it. So there, there's something here he's saying, he's saying, listen, I beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherein you're called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bonds of peace. He said, listen, I'm begging you to do this. But we, we, we kind of we kinda get this messed up in our heads about the vocation. Well, you know, I'm a welder. Is God calling me to be a, a welder for the kingdom? Yes, he is, but that's not really what this is talking about here. I mean, know that you can weld in integrity. You can, you can bookkeep in integrity. There are a lot of things that we can, in our lives we can manifest the, 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 the grace of God by doing it with excellence. But that's not what this is talking about here. Walk in the Greek here in the Strong's number 4043. 
in, in the, the Greek. It means to walk, to make one's way, to progress, to make due use of opportunities. You're going to have opportunities to fudge in the kingdom. You're going to have opportunities where the devil's going to put in front of you that either you can sin and leave that walk, leave the integrity that God wants us to do, or you can manifest his grace. It goes on to say, uh, Hebrew for to live, to regulate one's life, to conduct oneself. He said, listen, you, you need to look at every opportunity in life. Every time the devil puts a, a, a place in front of you to sin, it's a chance, an opportunity to do righteousness. This is the way that we've got to live. We've got to regulate our lives according to who we are in Messiah, who we are in the kingdom, and not in this other world, not in what we used to be, but who we are now. Because you give testimony to how you walk. If I'm giving into the flesh and I'm carnal and I'm doing all these things, I am giving testimony to the power of the devil. I think Mary did a wonderful job last week, and we're going to try to edit that two hours down. You guys thought I preach long. We're going to edit it down and, and, and get it ready to, to disseminate an MP3. But let me tell you something. Demonic forces, if they can get you when you get to that opportunity to feed them instead of giving glory to God... That's what they're all about. That is their chief thing, whether it is a, re a spirit of rejection, a spirit of loathing, uh, what, whatever it may be. They try to get you there, and where you should be re responding according to the kingdom of God, you respond to the old kingdom that you used to be imprisoned completely in, and they feed on that. But how many know that the glory of God, in a sense, is fed when you do the right thing? That testimony is built. It is increased when your flesh said yes and your, and your spirit said no and you obeyed the spirit. That's what this is talking about here. And worthy, so I, I'm going to, I need to walk, I need to regulate my life, I need to look for opportunities to do righteousness, to walk worthy, and it means suitable, worthily, in a manner worthy of. In a manner worthy of. In a manner worthy of what? Whereunto you are called. What are you called to? You're supposed to live your life in a manner worthy to be called to. And this vocation here in the Greek, which is Strong's 2821, means to call a calling an invitation to a feast of divine invitation to embrace salvation of God. And so you're to walk worthy of your calling into salvation. That's part of the Hebraic mindset, that my life is a walk, and I am called of God to walk worthy of what he has done in my life in a worthy manner so that what he has done can manifest through me. Now, every time we have a church split somewhere in the body of Christ, what's being manifested? It's not salvation. Every time that there's strife and all these different things, what's being manifested? Who does it give glory to? Because the Apostle Paul in this, he said, now listen, when you begin responding, when you start walking worthy of this call of salvation, here is how you're going to respond with all lowliness and meekness. You don't even have to prove yourself. You just do what's right. Consider that for a minute. Just doing the right thing. I've had ministers that, that have called me that there's some big hubbub in the church and, and there are folks that are lying about them or whatever. I mean, know oh, that there's, there's more things like that than Carter has liver pills that can evolve in a church, especially when the flesh gets in. And you know the man. You know the man's trying with all his heart to serve God. What do I do? No, I need to stand up. I said, just speak the truth. You don't need to prove yourself. Let God prove you. You don't need to defend yourself. You just speak truth. And you'd be amazed at how many times you do that. All of a sudden, it, there begins to be a delineation. Haughtiness, anger, deceitfulness, deception, manipulation, con contrasted to lowliness, humbleness, and truth. 
Or you say, what happens if, if the church splits? Let me tell you a situation. This, this is, goes back in the 90s. I went up and did a, a, uh, a graduation up in Pennsylvania, wasn't it? And that brother up there, this, uh, the church, there was a young man that was called to ministry. This church paid for him to go to school. Sent him off to, to, Bible, to Bible Institute. He went to two years. Not only did they pay his two years tuition, they sent him a uh, $400 or $500 stipend every month just to kind of help meet his needs. And within six months of coming back from the Bible Institute, he split the church. Took a group of them, went off, across town, started another church. And so I come to graduation, hear this stuff, and I'm expecting this pastor to be broken. Wouldn't you? I mean, you, you work hard to build a church. He was happy. It's like he had been set free. And I said, brother, what's going on? He said, he came back as a troublemaker. He gathered all the troublemakers together, and they went off, and that is now the first troublemaking church of this city. He said, my job has become so much easier. There's no strife in the church. It's like when they all left, the whole church went, oh, because he just sat and just spoke truth, and he said, I don't have to defend myself. I've, I've lived my life before you guys. You guys know me. If you think I'm that, then you don't need to be here. You see, if you live your life right, you can stand like that. If I, if I, if I am cognizant of my call to walk in a worthy manner of the salvation that I have been brought into, and it's, it's going to help you begin to stabilize some things in your life. One of the things that I, I have seen a lot in people is they wander from here to there. They just wander from this thing to that thing to this thing to that thing. And sometimes they, they do it in churches. And in the charismatic movement, used, we used to call them cruisematics. They'd cruise in, blow out, cruise in over here, blow out, cruise in over here. Every little new thing or every little new gust of wind. You know, and, and sometimes the wind may have been the result of somebody eating Mexican, but they would blow right on into it. And you, you kind of wonder what was going on. And there was, there, there, you can be satisfied doing the most lowliest thing in the kingdom if you're walking worthy of your calling. If you don't have that in place... They can create a throne for you and crown you and lavish you with compliments and you'll look for someplace else that's better. Because in your heart you know there is a peace that comes when you choose to walk in who you really are in Christ. It's not, it's not what you do on the outside, it's the peace on the inside. And that's part of what the Apostle Paul is talking. When you get there, you can move in lowliness, you can move in humility, you're going to bring the bonds of peace wherever you are because you're, you're not striving to fill something that only a true walk with Christ can fill. And the devil just kind of hands you out all these goodies, say, this will take care of it, this will take care of it, this, none of that will take care of it. Do you know how you can tell someone who doesn't walk in this? One of the hardest things, that, the hardest scripture for them in the word of God is be still and know that I am God. They start vibrating. You can start seeing their heads start going like this. And you're thinking, it's going to blow just any minute. You know, just, just let them set for about three weeks. Why? You don't have any peace within. You're trying to uh, extrapolate from external things the peace that can only come from being in Christ and just walking in who you really are. And just have the confidence. That's the scripture we read in, in Psalms 26. Lord, I have walked in mine integrity. If you've always done the right thing, you don't have to worry. God will take care of it. Where we get into panic mode is where we know we have been fudging and then the devil shows up. How many know fudge can have a high cost if you're not careful? Because the devil was getting you to dance on his landmines, and when you step on one, then there's a, a price to be paid. Paul is saying, don't, don't play in his field. Learn to walk worthy of our calling. Now, let's go to Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. Now, this is a, this is a prayer by the Apostle Paul. You know, I love the apostolic pastoral heart of Paul. Paul is a, is a pastoring apostle. 
It says, For this cause we also, since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. How many know that's good? Colossians chapter 1, verse 9 through 11. He said, I pray that you would be filled with the knowledge of God and, and, the, and of his will for your life, to, that that would just take hold in a real way in your life. Now look here at verse 10. And that ye might walk worthy of the Lord, to walk worthy of the Lord, to walk worthy of the Lord. Not to walk worthy of biblical life. Not to walk worthy of First Baptist, not to walk worthy of Assemblies of God, not to walk worthy of First Hebraic Roots Movement, but to walk worthy of the way the Lord walked. So that's personal responsibility. His grace is there to empower me to walk it. That's why, that's why he was saying, he said, listen, I am praying that you would be filled with all knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding that. We get in this word. Now, there's, there has been a transition somewhere or another, somehow in the charismatic movement. We get in this word to find out where all the blessings are. We get in this word to find out where all the good stuff is, and our definition of good stuff is how God is going to fill my house full of riches. And the Apostle Paul is saying, I want you to get in here to find out how to walk with Jesus. Can you see a difference? Here, here is something for the American that is hard to understand. You can have nothing and be at peace. Or for those every once in a while who get upset with my Ozarkian diction, nothing and be at peace. I remember years ago I heard of this young lady in Africa. She, she had one of those little tiki huts. And when the missionaries got there, she was just praising God and just happy. It, 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 would, it would have been like if Ed McMahon showed up with one of those big nine-digit checks. She was that happy. Do you know what she was happy about? The Lord had blessed her with a broom so that she could daily sweep her dirt floor. And every American went... <laughs> Praising God, that was one of the greatest things that God could have ever given her, and she was on cloud nine. You know why? It's not in what you have, it's in who you know. The knowledge of how to walk with him. Now let me tell you something, you start walking with him, the provision always comes. The word says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, and that's, that's in referring to need. And how many know needs are different than wants? Our, our needs are short and, our wants, are, and our, our wants are a mile long. Did you ever take a little kid into Toys R Us and said, you can get something? And they try to turn something into a boatload. All of a sudden, what, 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 what do you need? Everything! <laughs> And are you going to be happy as long as I get everything? <laughs> and how many know that if they've ever had situations like that, they go home and they're not satisfied with anything? <laughs> but you know what I found the greatest peace in it? This, when, when it's in the evening and the child will curl up in mom or dad's lap, you just loving on them. How many know that didn't come in a box? That wasn't manufactured somewhere, whether China or America. There's a satisfaction that comes from being who you are. That's part of what he's talking about here. But let's, let's go on just a little bit. He said that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. I love the way the complete Jewish Bible translates here, verse 10. It's so that you may live lives worthy of the Lord, entirely pleasing to him, being fruitful in every good work and multiplying in the full knowledge of God. It's one thing being in the kingdom. It's another thing when your walk pleases the Father. 
Let me give you a hint. That's the key to the good stuff. When your walk starts pleasing the Father, all of a sudden the Father starts loosing new levels of anointing in your life. He starts, look what it says here. It says, now, if you, if you're, if you walk worthy of the Lord unto pleasing Him, it's causing you to be fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, and the end result is you're going to be strengthened with all might. All might, not just some might, all might, according to his glorious power. Not even just his power, but his glorious power. The Apostle Paul is trying to paint something here that, listen, the secret to walking in the power of God and the blessing of God in a level that you have not yet experienced is when you start living to please him. Isn't that the way Jesus lived? I do nothing unless the Father shows me. I say nothing unless the Father says. That's why Jesus can walk in one place, heal one person, and walk out and not do another thing. Our flesh would have, would have wanted to set up a multinational ministry from right there. Church of the Troubled Waters. Now when you can't, now neighbor, when you can't get to the waters when the angel troubles, there is... The chapel of the oasis right here. We have the TV cameras. We want to document your miracle. We, we, have, we have Brother Big Doc from Mayo Clinic that's going to validate all the healings. Can you see how in the flesh you want to build something? You want to... It's like the Apostle Peter, they're sitting there, they're up there, and, and Jesus is glorified. You know, Moses and Elijah show up, and, and uh, Peter, let's build something. This is good, let's build something. No, it was just for them. And see, when you're pleasing to the Father, God can do a great miracle, and you'll never use it to, to build a platform for yourself. It's all about him. That's why Jesus could go in. There are times that he healed people that were miraculous healings, and Jesus said, shh. But Lord, we need to get this on video. <laughs> Just think of the people that would touch Lord. Shh. Because it pleased the Father just to touch that one or just to do that. See, that's how you, you get into the good stuff when it all gets about pleasing him and not pleasing people. When it gets about pleasing him and not even pleasing your flesh, you step into another place in your walk with God and you have a new, you have a new place to dwell in that very few ever get to. I don't know about you, but that sounds good to me because I want to be strengthened with all might. I've had my fill of being strengthened by a good jolt of java in the morning. I want something a little stronger that goes the distance. I, w I want his strength on the inside of me. I want his purpose. I want to know how to walk with him. That's one of the things that Moses did. The Israel saw the wonders of God. Isn't that what we have in a lot, in a lot of churches today? Everybody comes to see the wonder. I'm tired of gawking. I want to be like Moses. I want to learn how to produce the miracle. I want to learn how to get into a place where God can flow through me and, and all of a sudden to cause that fruit in that area to begin to manifest so that he gets the glory. I'm done gawking. I want to start walking. But it's when I become walk conscious of my personal responsibility to walk in the kingdom because not only does he gives me strength it also he gives me patience and long suffering with joy Mary will tell you that I've had long suffering but it was not with joy it was with a big jar of vinegar I'm going to hold out for the Lord you didn't hear me going, woohoo, I'm going to hold out for the Lord. <laughs> it's like this thing is right and I'm going to stand. But God says, listen, when we learn to enter into that walk right, he begins to strengthen us with all might in our inner man. And we can actually stand where he's called us to stand. And in the midst of that stand with patience and long suffering, he's going to mingle it with joy when you're walk conscious. 
Everybody's looking for a secret formula. How many know in marriage there's no secret formula? It's learning how to walk with each other in love and putting the other one before them. When you start doing that, everything else kind of falls into place. It's that way with walking with God. When I, when I understand that the, not only is the world watching, heaven is watching and hell is watching my walk. Heaven is waiting for opportunities for the kingdom to come. Hell is waiting for the opportunities for their kingdom to come. And what opens up the door to either one is my walk. It's my walk. That's our responsibility. Let's go to the next one, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 10 through 12. Are you beginning to see why I harp so much on paths to dwell in? Paths to walk in? Ways to walk? You know, it's real easy to do a seminar on 49 ways to get blessed. But I want to move beyond getting blessed. I want to go to where I'm the blessing. Isn't, wasn't that, the, wasn't that the, the promise of Abraham? I'm going to bless you and make you a blessing. Let's look here in 1 Thessalonians 2, starting with verse 10. Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameable we behaved ourselves among you that believe. Boy, don't you wish that most ministers could say that when they came to visit? The Apostle Paul said, listen, we're not just preaching this. We lived it in front of you. Even when we could have took advantage, even when we could have. There were times that Paul said, listen, it was right for us. We could have took up a big offering for ourselves because we've come and labored. And instead, he went and made tents to pay his own way so that he wouldn't be a burden on them. And then he goes on to say, as you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children that you may walk worthy of God who are called into his kingdom and glory. This can be said another way, that you walk worthy of someone who resides in the kingdom. We need to quit walking as Americans. We need to start walking as citizens of the kingdom of God. Our nationality, is, as far as our nation comes, secondary because kingdom always triumphs nation. If you understand how the old kingdoms used to work, you could have a king over a kingdom and there were many nations underneath that king. And I need to walk worthy of my king in his kingdom, regardless if I'm American, if I am a European, if I, if I am a Filipino. It, our, my nationality is secondary to this new kingdom that I have been birthed into. And I've got to become kingdom conscious to walk worthy of the God of that kingdom. See law. Sit and think about that for a minute. When I get in the flesh, what kingdom am I representing? There's only two. And no, you do not have the kingdom of you. The kingdom of God or the kingdom of darkness. And really, guys, I'm going to say this. You can tell by what a person is attracted to what kingdom they're used to flowing in. If they run after darkness every time it, it runs up its little head, then they're used to moving in that darkness and that becomes familiar to them. If I start walking with Jesus all the time, I'm no, I'm no longer familiar with these things. I'm familiar with the kingdom and I begin to be attracted to the things of the kingdom. You know, being, 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 I remember being raised up on Echo Lane. There, there are people that I was familiar with that I was used to running with and everything. But, you know, after I left there and began running with other people, you, you, you go back and it may have been someone that you knew your whole childhood. And there, you, you, this is supposed to be Jim and you knew Jim your whole life life, but now you're sitting there in front of Jim, and Jim is a complete stranger to you. He took one path, you took another, and now who Jim has become is, is unfamiliar to you. And see, that's the way the kingdom of darkness needs to be, because there was a day that I ran into the cross, and my path divided from darkness, and as it 
did, it, it, uh, I begin becoming somebody else. And when I get back around this stuff, it's uncomfortable. It's no longer familiar to me. I, you know, I, I've, I've met with some old friends, and I enjoyed kind of reminiscing a little bit about the past. But let me tell you something. There were also times it was a relief when it was over because they tried to mold me back into something I no longer am. There's some places I just don't like to go because they try to mold me into a Mike Lake that died about 30 some odd years ago. That Mike Lake is dead and buried. And, they're, and, they, and they insist on, no, this is the way you need to be. I'm not that dude anymore. Don't put me back into that. I worked really hard to kill that guy. <laughs> I worked hard putting that guy under and becoming somebody else. And I refuse to go back to being that. And it's, we need to be that way with darkness. Because darkness wants to pour you back in the mold of who you used to be before you got saved. And if you start walking with the Lord, walking to please him, begin, begin conscious of my day and today walk, we make Christianity event you do for two or three hours on the weekend. And then you continue walking like you did before you got saved. How I many you know that Christians, you know, everybody, everybody is all like, ooh, Halloween's bad, ooh, it's bad, it's bad, you know, the mask, ooh, it's bad. Let me tell you something, Christians can put on masks faster than any Halloween kid. I have seen them at Walmart. Brother like, <laughs> I mean, it's like, didn't that hurt your face when you did that? I mean, uh, I'm going to confess something here. I, I have a hard time doing that. Anybody ever notice I, I don't hide my emotions well? If I'm mad, everybody knows I'm mad, you know. And so I, I've seen people, and I've been in a bad mood, and I've seen them at Walmart, and I've ducked. <laughs> it's like, I don't want you to see the way I'm feeling right now, so to give you grace, I just duck behind a big stereo. <laughs> Oh, Lord, help me because they don't need to see the way I'm feeling right now because the devil's been on my back and I'm still in the middle of warfare. Come on. We're being real this morning. There should be no masks in the body. If you're used to walking in darkness and putting on a mask of light, which one's going to feel more natural to you? But if God's kingdom is the real because I've let him do this work in me and I, I have I have chosen to to walk worthy of the Lord. That 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 is something you gotta choose to do. Most Christians never choose to do it because they're never taught that's even an option. I remember sitting in seminary and I was you know you get into Calvinistic type of theology. Well brother you gotta sin every day. Yeah I used to. That's where I found grace. Now because of the cross, I can, choose, I, can, I can tell sin, no. I crucify the flesh. I'm not going to be that way. And if you crucify it long enough, it'll die. It may take a while. It may squeal on the cross you know, for, for days on end, but eventually that thing will die. How many know what I'm talking about? You wonder why God doesn't want to steep pork? Because anytime you poke one of those things on the cross, it squeals like a pig till the time it dies. It don't want to die. Let it die and never go back. And then, when a pig tries to come along, the stench repels you instead of attracts you. Because I want to walk worthy of him who has called me unto his kingdom, but the apostle Paul didn't stop there. And glory. God's called you to walk in some glory if you get into the kingdom. I mean, a little t glory is an interesting thing. A little dabble, do you? A little dabble glory will carry you for a long time. It's kind of like manna. It'll carry you for a long time. Let's look at the last one of these. It's found in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 4. Now, I thought this interesting. This isn't even the Apostle Paul talking. This is Jesus. How many know Jesus trumps Paul? Now, that may be hard for a lot of Christians to understand. Jesus trumps 
Paul. So if there's something the Apostle Paul says that seems like it disagrees with Jesus, you got Paul all wrong because Jesus trumps the Apostle Paul. Now look at here. Now he's dealing with some things that happened in Sardis. And look what he says here at the end. He says, For thou hast a few names even in Sardis which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. That's, I, I believe that all of the seven churches, not only were they seven periods within uh, church history, but I believe there are seven challenges that the church is going to have to face as we move into the book of Revelation. And one of them is believers are not walking with the Lord as they should. They started out with garments that were white, and they have soiled them by their behavior, by their character, by not walking with God, by walking with other spirits. And Jesus said, says they can't walk with me. Ow. Jesus is one that unless you're all in white, you don't get to walk with him. Especially if you're going to walk through tribulation, you don't finish the walk because every one of those spots is a bullseye. I'm going to say this. Whenever I allow sin in my life, and how many know the devil never starts out with a big sin? He starts out with a little one. What that does, that becomes a homing device for more sin. It begins to attract like kind. And its purpose is to get big enough, it becomes a target. So now, you, now you're targeted of the devil, and you have a homing device, a multitude of homing devices, and then you wonder why the devil can constantly hit your life. Now, during normal times, that's rough. But going through, the, the, going through the book of Revelation, going through tribulation, the last thing you want is the devil to have a homing device on you. Because it, it, it will hunt you down, seek you, and explode in your face. But if I keep myself from being defiled of those things and keep my garments white, he has nothing that he can lock on to but the kingdom of God can lock onto it. Not only can the kingdom of God lock onto it, I'm walking with the king. How I many know one of the safest places to be in hard times is to be an entourage for the king? This is one of the secrets of making it through tribulation, is being a part of the king's entourage that wherever he walks, that's where I walk. Whatever he's involved with, I'm involved with because there is protection, there is provision, and there is vision where the king dwells. We got to get that, guys. I want to go to one last verse. We need to learn to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 15. How many know this counters what, what, what is most of what you hear on Christian television today? It's like, come and let Jesus give you a whammy and it's going to be all right. You know, this, 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 this yield on this thing, we want this little experience, we want this, we want this experience to undo all our stupidity. And the truth of the matter is God can touch us and to set us free of that which perpetrated our, stu our stupidity. But then he says, you know what? As you walk it out, you leave those things behind. And the more you walk with him, the more distance you get between him and those things. That's where you get the greatest victory, is after God knocks off the chains, leave the dungeon. Walk out of the castle. Walk out of its territory and into a territory it does not control. That's the way to staying free. But let's look at this in, in, Ephesians, in uh, Philippians. He's, he's uh, trying to get them to do some things. He says, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but much more in my absence. Now there is a... Um, Conundrum. How many of us have had kids that have little halos on them the whole time that we're around them, but the minute you step out of the room, that sucker kind of cocks to the side? Do you know when a child matures? Is when you leave the room and they'll demand of themselves to act better than when you were, when you were in the room. Oh, I'm in charge. I've got to make sure everything's just exactly the way mom and dad wants it. 
That, that, that begins to manifest some maturity, doesn't it? That's what the Apostle Paul is saying. He said, listen, you, you guys walked right the way that we were teaching you how to walk with God. You, you, you mimicked us and you learned how to do it and you were very conscious of how to walk around us. But now that we have left, you even put more emphasis on what we taught you because now we're not here to correct you. This is what he's talking about here. But look what he says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Work out your own salvation. No Christian anymore is taught to work out their own salvation. They're told to go up front and to pray a 30-second prayer, and they get their Willy Wonka golden ticket, and they think, now heaven's got to let them in, and they, and they go and they sit down, and they learn how to mimic whatever religious culture is within that body. That's not working out your own salvation. Because let me tell you something. How many know when you got saved, your spirit got redeemed, but your mind was still full of demonic teaching? Well, I was never a witch. I'm not talking about a witch. I'm talking about demonic teaching. You were, you were a sinner. You thought like a sinner. You did it as second nature. You know, you didn't have to sit down and say, hmm, how am I going to sin today? You just did it. And all the wounds and the hurts that those demons put in your life that created strongholds. I don't know the Apostle Paul says we're supposed to pull down strongholds. But we've never even thought what a stronghold was. Every little boy knows what a fort is. That's a stronghold. That that demon used your wounds and all the different things in your life, and he built himself a little fortified area in your life so that he could rule uh, from that fort, and you won't go there because you won't go through the walls of the pain or the rejection or the misunderstanding or all those different things that he used to erect that fort. You won't go there to get him out. And eventually, through the power of God, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but power, to, power through God to the pulling down of those strongholds. Jesus' healing is greater than my hurt. And as I learn to pull it down, I can kick him out. And as I start, as I start going through my, this apartment complex called the mind and soul of Mike Lake, and I start kicking out the squatters, I start kicking out all the ites, I start running, I start running out the, the, the Philistines and, and, and all the different ones. And when you look at all those listed in the Old Testament, every one of them, when you look at the root meaning of that name, it can mean things like uh, lasciviousness and, and procrastination and envy. Uh, those, just as God says, I want you to, to, to run the iniquity out of the land, it's our task as believers as I start walking with him that I begin working out my salvation by the strongholds the devil has put in my life by tearing down those strongholds by the power of God and begin to chase them out of my life. He also gives us a key here in verse 13. For it is God that worketh in you to both do, but to both will and to do his good pleasure. And actually what he's doing, he's painting a picture. We need to understand a lot of our want to and a lot of our can do is spiritually inspired. You can have demonic spirits that give you your want to and produce the can do. Anybody ever seen anybody set their mind to the flesh and get fired up in the flesh to get it done? A, a spirit came and deposited the will to do something. And then not only gave them the will, but produced the opportunity to get it done. Do you know, if a man sets his heart to, a, to, to commit adultery, the enemy will see to it that women come out of the woodwork. If a man sets his heart to embezzle, he will be given opportunity after opportunity after opportunity that looks foolproof in which he can embezzle. Because there was a demonic spirit that put the will and then gave the ability to do into motion. And so now Paul is contrasting that, listen, you were this, but now you're this, and guess what? As you surrender to God, now God is the one who puts the will in you to start doing the right thing, and if I yield to that, he'll give me the can-do. He'll begin providing the opportunities to do what he's put in my heart. 
That's part of working out that salvation because I've got to work out the desire to respond to the other and only respond to God. And we have so many in churches across this nation that are saying they're walking with God, but they're still responding to their old taskmasters. And sometimes calling it the Holy Spirit. That's why God's got established paths for us to walk in. The commandments, you can never look at the spirit of what the commandments say, and there's no demon that could ever flow with that. Now, I tell you what I have found, he can go with the letter of the law and cause you to run over and hurt somebody, and you're saying, well, I'm obeying a commandment because you've not understood the spirit of what God was trying to, to, to convey to you. Because a, a religious spirit doesn't matter what, what expression of that religiosity is manifested as long as it doesn't reveal the heart of God. But when you look at the spirit of God's commandments, the spirit of God's word, it will always flow with his kingdom, not with the other. But we've got to, we, we, when a desire is put in our hearts and it begins to be fueled, we have got to ask ourselves, who put it there and who's putting the fuel on the fire? If it's of the devil, it will release, you won't have, you will have loftiness instead of humbleness. You will have pride instead of meekness. You'll have all these things of the flesh manifesting, and the whole time you'll have this thing going off in your head, you deserve to feel this way. You deserve this. You have a right. When the whole time when God's moving, he'll say, Jesus earned you this. Jesus made this available. Don't raise up and defend yourself. Just simply walk with him. God will work it out if you trust him. He'll put the desire not to, not to raise up the flesh, but to bring down the flesh and to walk with him in humility. That's why that, that's where the work really comes in, guys, because that's work. I like what the Apostle Paul said. He said, you need to work it. And why, why with fear and trembling? Because I know my, propens my propensity to kick into the flesh. Guys, I fought a spirit of rejection for a long, long time. And it manifests itself in some kind of, kind of crazy ways. I would come very dominating over something if I thought it would be a way of building me up. And I've, I've had to really work on that because I responded to that spirit so many years, it became second nature. It stole my joy, stole the joy of everybody around me. I thought one of the neatest things, and I, I found it coming out of my own mouth. And it's, it's, it's interesting when you get to the place you get blessed by the things coming out of your own mouth instead of embarrassed. But this last week when, uh, when I went down to Cleveland, I went there and I said, I'm here to serve, not to be served. Because that's what God put in my heart. I had a lot of things I wanted to do. And when I'm gone from home anyway, I don't sleep a lot. So I was doing with four and five hours sleep a night and trusting a lot in caffeine <laughs> during the day. You need that after you get 50. And you know what? It, although there was, there was a lot of uh, exhaustiveness, it was a joy. Because God's given me s some abilities in some areas these guys didn't have. And the be being able to help them to come in to do that and just made their life easier blessed me. It just blessed me. You see, that's, that's a part of walking in the kingdom. You can let God flow with the abilities he's given you. There's no strings attached. It's not about people patting you on the head and saying how wonderful you are. You can go in the back door, do it, and walk out the back door. Nobody really even knew you did it. And you're satisfied that God saw. God saw. God took note. And it's God who promotes and God who blesses. That's, that's just a better way of doing it. And it, 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 it takes all the, uh, the dread out. You're all, you're all worried. Boy, I'm doing this. I wonder if anybody's going to give me recognition. I wonder, I wonder, 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 wonder. When you walk this way, that's not there. Let me tell you something, guys. 
God has already counted the hairs on your head, and sometimes he's got to rework that daily total, you know. He knows, and if he knows that, he knows everything that you've done, whether anybody else sees. When you get that concept, I'm not going to sin because he who sees when nobody else sees, sees me. But also when I do the right thing and I bless people and I respond out of my spirit, it doesn't matter if anybody else sees because the same one who saw me when I was sinning that nobody else did, he sees me when I'm doing the right thing when nobody else did. In that part of when Jesus was teaching the Sermon on the Mount, he says, he says don't do things to be seen of men. Do things to be seen of the Father because if you do it with only him in mind, he'll bless you. We need to learn. Philippians 2.13 is something I pray over myself every day. Lord, I stand on your word that you're going to cause me to will and to do your good pleasure. Lord, I choose to lend my members under righteousness. I loathe unrighteousness. I will not allow them to cause me to do and to will anything. I stand against that. And Father, I'm pleading with heaven, Father, fulfill your word in my life so that I can walk with you worthy of who you are and your calling in my life. God, every day you put your will in my life, and God will never put a desire in you that he doesn't give you the power to fulfill because he's a good God. He's not an unjust God. It would be unjust to give somebody a desire to do something and then withhold the ability to do it. That's not our God. Every good gift comes down from him above. Every good gift. I want to center up on one last word where it talked about the, the, that it works in us. It is God who worketh in you, that worketh in you. That word in the Greek is energiou. We get the word energize from. It is God who energizes his will in you. It is God who gives you the energy to do. Why do you draw your energy from? Who are you drawing your energy from? If I'm walking with God, I can draw that energy from God because God is energizing me to know his will and to do it. When it comes to God's will, we need to be energizer bunnies in the earth. To the devil's chagrin, we just keep going and going and going because we tap into an energy that he was disconnected from the day he fell. We get to tap into what he unplugged from that made him think he was hot, hot stuff. And the truth of the matter is he's getting weaker every day. But as long as I'm walking with God, I can get stronger in my spirit every day. That's why Moses was 120 and his eye was not dim nor was his strength debated because he, he walked all those years plugged into God. Plugged into God. And guys, I want you to plug into God and the only way that you can is in the walk. It's in the walk. What gives you energy? What, 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 what releases strength in you? Is it getting all huffy and puffy or is it getting humble and submitting to God? Look at what, what's energizing you and there's some things you may need to cut off so that you can really plug into the real thing. Now, Father God, I thank you today for your word. Father, I thank you that it will not return to you void. Father, I ask that you would loose within every one of us a grace to walk worthy of our calling in the kingdom. Father, it's only by your grace. And Father, for each person who listens to this message, I ask that you would release power in their lives, that you would begin causing them to will and to do your good pleasure. Father, we claim it this morning in the name of Jesus.